right uh, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, in yesterday's class uh, we initiated the past paper discussion for cambridge igcse chemistry paper 2 i think we have uh, only discussed the only discussed seven questions and in this video i am going to be explaining from the last question right so here uh, we will discuss the question 40 now the question 40 is basically coming from inorganic chemistry now inorganic chemistry is an ocean right so that is a big chapter but we haven't uh, initiated that part yet now we are only studying the uh, basic concepts of chemistry now uh, with this question i'm going to uh, introduce you inorganic chemistry now inorganic chemistry is like an ocean right so if we study about uh, elements in the periodic table and uh, non-carbon uh, molecules in the in the nature we will study about inorganic chemistry right so in, in inorganic chemistry we study about elements in the periodic table ions cation we will identify an ions cations and we will uh, react elements with the uh, water uh, air uh, base in acids and so on that is a big chapter right now if you look at the 40th question now let's uh, try to uh, read the question and uh, i will explain the theories related to this question and we will try to find the answer for this question right okay now, if you look at uh, here, the results of some test on an aqueous solution of substance X is listed. Now, what it says is, now we have a substance X, right? Now we have a substance X. We don't know what it is. We don't know what it is. Now we have to find out the name of this substance X. For that, we perform some chemical experiments uh, to find out uh, the name of this uh, substance. Now, by finding out the anions and cations present in this substance, we can come to uh, a conclusion what substance this exists, right? Okay. Now, they are telling a cream precipitate is produced when adding aqueous silver nitrate. Now, what you do is you take a, a test tube and you put uh, this substance X, right? Now, here you have to add silver nitrate aqueous silver nitrate AgNO3 right so AgNO3 aqueous AgNO3 aqueous AgNO3 aqueous now why we use AgNO3 aqueous is to find out which type of halogen is present in this uh, substance right so basically AgNO3 test is uh, done for halides now, if we have, now halides mean we have chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So, typically, these three are called uh, halogens. Now, now, halogens can make halides. Now, these are halogens. Now, if we say, now, okay, now, let's say, okay, now, I will just tell the name of these uh, elements. These are called halogens. Group 17 or group 7A elements are called Halogens, right? Halogens. And halides mean if we have Cl minus, we have Cl minus. Now, this chlorine has accepted one electron to become Cl minus. And Br minus, since they are non metal, they will accept one, uh, they, they will accept electron. And in the outermost shell of this chlorine, we have seven electrons to satisfy or to hold octet rule it will uh, accept one electron now cl minus br minus and i minus so these three uh, ions are called anions these three anions are called halides so the common name that we give for these three ions is halides right halides Okay, I am starting from the beginning, right? You don't need to bother about that. Now we are going to start inorganic chemistry, right? So things are going to become slightly complicated, right? Okay, that's all. But that is not a big deal. You can study all of them. Okay, now here a cream precipitate is produced when adding aqueous silver nitrate. 
Now, if you put A, G, N, O, 3, now uh, as a result, you get, uh, you know, cream cream precipitate mean pale yellow color precipitate, precipitate, right? Okay. Now, I will just draw this here. So here, you get uh, precipitate. Now, let's say this is aqueous. Uh, after adding Kg in no 3 we have solution. And finally, we get some precipitate, precipitate, right? A cream color. Cream color means cream precipitate. Cream precipitate. Cream precipitate. Cream PPT. Now, you should know this theory, right? So, let me move to the next slide. Okay, right. Um, Okay, now silver nitrate test for halogens. Silver nitrate test is done for halogens. So the halogens, uh, I mean halides, right? So halides mean Cl minus, Br minus, and, and I minus. Now let's assume we have chloride in this test tube, bromide in this test tube, and iodide in this test tube. Now the samples, now these are called samples, and these samples to be tested are first ICD5. Now, for what we have to do is we have to first add some uh, acid into these samples. If you want to, uh, if you have any carbonates to get rid of those carbonate ions, if you put uh, uh, acid, uh, you will, you know, uh, the carbonates ions will be get rid by evaporating as CO2 gas, right? Okay. Now, the first thing you should do is for these samples, you should add some acid. Typically, we add uh, HNO3, I mean, nitric acid. Okay. So, using dilute nitric acid. Now, you see, uh, for example, why we do this is CO3 2 minus. If we have carbonate ion, CO3 2 minus. Now, when we add acid, so acid means they will um dissociate h plus ions right h plus ions so basically we denote h plus for acid now what will happen is uh, co2 gas will be produced co2 gas will be produced so uh, co2 gas will be evaporated so if we have any carbonate ions in this sample we can add the h plus ion so that we can uh, get rid of these carbonate ions. Otherwise, the experiment will be uh, destroyed. Okay. Right. Now, the next thing that we have to do is we have to add some AgNO3 solution. So then silver nitrate solution is added. So uh, if you add silver nitrate solution to the sample, here, uh, as a result, you will get white color precipitate. If it is chloride, if it is chloride, then you will get white color precipitate. And if it is bromide, you will get cream precipitate, which means pale yellow color precipitate. And if you have iodide in this solution, you will get yellow color precipitate, right? So you should remember. So here it is uh, summarized here, you can see. It is summarized here, right? Okay. Now, if you look at this one, halide ions are Cl minus, Br minus, and ion I minus, right? Now, what we add this AgNO3. So, a silver nitrate means AgNO3. So, what we are interested in AgNO3 is Ag plus, right? Because it wants to react with a anion. So, it should be a cation. So, Ag plus aqueous and Cl minus aqueous will result AgCl solid. Now, this is the precipitate. And the color of this precipitate is white. And if we have Br minus, Ag plus aqueous plus Br minus aqueous will produce AgBr solution, which is cream color, which means a pale yellow. And here iodide, iodide. And Ag plus aqueous in I minus aqueous will result you Ag ice solid, which means yellow color precipitate. Now, here they have mentioned a point you can see nitric acid is needed to get rid of carbonate or hydroxide ion so if you have hydroxide ion or carbonate ion to get rid of uh, those carbonate ion and if you have hydroxide ion uh, they will they will evaporate as h2 gas right and if you have carbonate ion they will evaporate as co2 gas then you can perform the 
uh, experiment smoothly, right? Okay. Now, these would form silver carbonates or silver hydroxide, which are soluble. Why? Because, uh, as I told you, if you have a carbonate ions, okay, now let's assume in this uh, sample, we have Cl minus, and in this sample, if we have Cl minus and Ag, I'm sorry, CO32 minus and OH minus, right? OH minus. Now, if you put... Uh, Ag plus here. Now here Ag2CO3 will be formed. Why? Because we have CO3 2 minus CO3 2 minus CO3 2 minus plus if you put H plus if I'm sorry Ag plus Ag plus if you put Ag and no 3 Ag uh, plus now what will be formed? Ag2CO3. Now this Ag2CO3, now this Ag2CO3 is soluble, which means it will not provide any uh, precipitate. So you cannot uh, see the precipitate because it will dissolve the solution, right? So what you have to do is to get rid of the CO2 and OH minus ions. Otherwise, if you had uh, OH minus here, and if you put Ag here, you will get AgOH. Now AgOH is also soluble, which will not produce any precipitate. So go, to get rid of these two anions, you have to put AgNO3 before adding um, silver nitrate into these solutions, right? So this is the chart you should remember. So the, in summary, in summary, if you have a solution, if you have a solution, now if you put AgNO3 into this solution, if you have Cl minus, if you have Cl minus, you will get white color precipitate. If you have Br minus, you will get cream, creamy precipitate. And if you have I minus, you will get yellow color precipitate. So now we will move to the uh, question. Okay, right. Now, let me erase all of these annotations. Now they are telling a cream precipitate is produced when adding aqueous silver nitrate. Now, when you put aqueous silver nitrate, you get cream in precipitate. So the sample or the substance X should have bromide ions, right? Bromide ions. So what you can tell is the A can be the answer or C can be the answer, but B and D cannot be the answer because if we had chloride ions in this X, when we add silver nitrate, we should have gained a white color precipitate, but we got only a cream color precipitate. So we can eliminate B and D from our choices, right? Okay, now uh, adding aqueous sodium hydroxide produces a green precipitate which dissolves in excess alkali. So, which means uh, sodium hydroxide is alkali. Now, when you put sodium hydroxide uh, drop-wise, you get pre uh, green color precipitate. And when you put more uh, sodium hydroxide, now this precipitate dissolves and give you a complex uh, ion, right? So here, what we have to do, what we have to study as theory is, Okay, now here you see aqueous sodium hydroxide and aqueous ammonia test for cations. Now we are going to identify ions, right? So in organic, in inorganic chemistry, we have to identify ions. Now ions, we have two types of ions. Now cations and anions. Now for cations, we have several tests. For anions also, we have several tests. Now we will uh, study them individually one by one later. But now what I'm going to teach you is aqueous sodium hydroxide test and aqueous ammonia test for cations. Now to identify cations, to identify cations, earlier we studied silver nitrate test for anions. So to identify whether halogens are present, I mean, sorry, whether halides are present in a particular uh, sample, we have to use AgNO3 solution, right? If you got uh, white color precipitate, you can come to a conclusion that the sample contained uh, Cl minus. If you got creamy precipitate, you can tell the sample initially contained uh, uh, Br minus. And if you got yellow color precipitate, you can tell uh, the sample contains 
I minus, right? Now you just look at this picture. Now you just look at this picture. Okay. Right. Now cations are given in this column. Aqueous sodium uh, hydroxide. The observation when we put aqueous sodium hydroxide to these uh, cations is given here. And uh, the observations for uh, aqueous ammonia for uh, when we add aqueous ammonia to these uh, cations are given in this column. Now, if you have ammonium plus, if you put uh, sodium hydroxide, these are the uh, observations. But we are interested in green color only because in the question it is given green, right? So uh, we will study this chart later, right? Uh, through theory, right? Through theory, we will study these later. But here you see green color cells. Now, here in green color cells, when we put sodium hydroxide, chromium 3 plus and Fe2 plus will give green color precipitate. Chromium 3 plus and Fe2 plus will give you green color precipitate. But this green color precipitate is soluble in, ex in excess. Means, okay, now when you add the uh, sodium hydroxide drop wise, it will form a green color precipitate. But when we add, now you see chromium 3 plus, now chromium 3 plus, now this is chromium 3 plus. Now when we add sodium solution drop wise, it will form a precipitate. But when you add excess sodium hydroxide, that precipitate will dissolve and form a complex ion. Okay, but if you had Fe2 plus, that precipitate is insoluble. Now, even though if you put excess NaOH solution, now let's assume here we have, uh, uh, here we have Fe2 plus. Now, if we have Fe2 plus here, now if you put uh, NaOH solution drop wise, it will form a precipitate. But when you add excess NaOH solution into this sample, this precipitate will not dissolve the precipitate will remain the same there will be no change even though if you put excess amount of NaOH solution so what they are telling in this question is you see here right adding aqueous sodium hydroxide produces a green precipitate so the answer can be both chromium and iron because here we have chromium 3 plus and here we have iron 2 plus right so here from this uh, statement, we cannot come to an answer, right? But if you read continuously, which dissolves in excess alkali. So if it is dissolving, when we put excess alkali, that should be chromium 3 plus. If you have iron 2 plus, that precipitate is insoluble in excess NaOH solution. So the answer is, yeah, we earlier eliminated this B and D. So here it should be chromium 3 plus. So the A is the answer, right? Okay. Now adding aqueous ammonia produces a green precipitate, which is insoluble in excess ammonia. So if you again go to that uh, table, you see here, if we had chromium 3 plus, now you put ammonia, right? Instead of NaOH solution, you put ammonia. In that case, what will happen? Uh, it will form a green color precipitate, but that is insoluble in excess. Now, even though if you put excess ammonia into that precipitate, that precipitate will not dissolve, okay? But here, if you had, uh, that is okay, right? Okay, now from the second statement itself, we came to the answer, okay? Okay, so from the state, uh, from the second statement itself, we came to the answer. So 
uh, we can uh, we can just verify whether the statements are uh, true or false. Yeah, that is true, right? Because when you add uh, ammonium ammonia uh, solution to chromium three plus, it will give you green color precipitate, and that precipitated insoluble in excess uh, ammonia, which means that will not dissolve in that will not dissolve in excess ammonia. Okay. Right. Now, what we will do is we will go to the second, I'm sorry, the previous question, that is 39. So we have discussed the 40th question here, right? And we studied about the silver nitrate test for halides, and we studied two tests for cations, right? The, those are aqueous sodium hydroxide test and aqueous ammonium test. Now we will study about paper chromatography. Now we have already studied about paper chromatography. Right now a question is asked here. Now RF values are used to identify unknown substances using paper chromatography. Right now RF value means we have learned about um, retention factor, right? So we have an equation for retention factor. What is that? RF is equal to distance distance traveled traveled by uh, the substance by the substance substance um, divided by divided by distance traveled by the solvent distance traveled by the solvent. Okay. So this is the equation for retention factor. Right, now we will continue reading the question. RF values are always less than one. Yeah, because for example, if you have a paper chromatography paper like this. Now, this is the baseline. Now, this is, now the substance has traveled here and the solvent has traveled here, right? Okay, now let's say uh, this is X, this is, okay. Now we will say this is uh, one. Okay, now let's say this is 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter. And the distance traveled by this substance is, uh, let's say, five centimeter, five centimeter, five centimeter. Now, if you substitute these values in this equation, we will get five, five divided by 10, which is equal to 0 0.5. So here, the solvent travels along with the solvent based on the solubility of the substance, it also travel. But the substance cannot travel beyond the limit of that solvent. So it cannot be beyond one. So uh, the sometimes the RF value might be one. Now, if the solubility of the solvent and the substance are same, now uh, the RF value can be one, but it is always less than one because uh, that is not possible because uh, the solvent's uh, solubility and the substance solubility cannot be the same, right? So RF values are always uh, less than one. That statement is correct. So if you look at the answers, now A can be the answer. A can be the answer. B can be the answer. But this C and D cannot be the answer because it doesn't contain the response A, right? Because we have already decided that the first answer should come as a choice, right? Okay. Now, if you look at the second one, RF value is equal to uh, distance traveled by solvent divided by... No, this is wrong, right? Because we already know this is the equation for... Um, RF, but they have uh, given the reciprocal of this equation. So the second answer cannot be the answer. So from these two, now the probability of getting the correct answer is 50, right? Because we have eliminated two out of four. So either A or B can be the answer. But now from after reading the second statement, we have decided that this A also cannot be the answer. So why? Because the second is false. 
So this also cannot be the answer. So the answer is 1, 2, 1, and 3. Okay. Right. Now, what we will do is we will move to the next question. Now, what I am going to do is I am going to revise is that paper chromatography because uh, you might have forgotten the things. I will just revise quickly paper chromatography, right? So let me open your PDF and Right, we studied about paper chromatography under separation methods, right? What's this? Twenty two. Right, so we studied the uh, uh, paper chromatography under separation methods. Yeah, now you see paper chromatography. So here. Uh, you should remember these terms because they might ask any question, right? So the now here you see uh, uh, here now okay now if you look at this picture now you drop a ink on the paper after that you drop some water so what will happen the water will spread over the paper and along with the water based on the solubility of the components in the ink they also will um, disperse or they also will spread right so it will form some circles like this so uh, here you see blue ring and red ring and yellow ring so based on their stability i'm sorry solubility they will um, travel along with the solvent here the solvent is uh, water and the substance that we uh, test is ink okay right now you see here the chromatogram so the filter paper that we use normally we use filter paper for this purpose now this paper is called for a chromatogram so sometimes they might ask so they might give some uh, statements the paper the filter paper used in paper chromatography is called chromatogram so that statement is true so you might need these things right and chroma means color you should know these uh, terminologies right and whatever you should know is uh, here this equation is very important and um, okay now the dyes in the ink have different solubilities in water so they travel across the paper at different rates the more soluble one travel faster if the solubility is higher then it will travel faster and uh, to a uh, you know highest distance right okay so this is why the they separate into rings the filter paper with the colored ring is called chromatogram now this paper right so after chromatography is done the paper with the separated components is called chromatogram right okay now you should remember this term the filter paper with colored rings is called the chromatogram right so the paper the the, the, the filter paper is not called the chromatograph this paper after, with the rings is called chromatogram okay now this is how we have to do right now you see uh, let, let's uh, look at this experiment okay now prepare a concentrated solution of x a b c and d in propanol right place a spot of each along a line on chromatography paper label them now we take some uh, dyes okay uh, solutions right and we use in uh, propanol right so what we do is we place x uh, sample a sample b sample c sample and d sample on a paper and we have to draw a 
uh, line along the uh, paper, right? That, that should be a horizontal line. And on the line, we have to place the sample and we have to dip the paper by rolling into propanone. So what will happen? The propanone will uh, be absorbed by this paper and the propanone will travel up to this point. Okay, let's assume uh, up to this point, the propanone travels. That is the solvent. So here the solvent is propanone. And let's say this has traveled up to this point. And based on the solubility of these dyes, now this is A, this is B, C, D, right? But this X has all these A. Now X is the mixture of A, B, C, and D, right? A, B, C, and D. But uh, we have to put A separately, B. Okay, now we take, uh, okay, now this is what we have to do. Now we have to take blue color ink, blue color dye, yellow color dye, green color dye, and pink color dye. Now we have to place some drops on this paper. And we have to mix all these four colors and uh, take a mixture of X. Then we have to place that mixture also here. Now what will happen? We The, the, the dyes will be separated based on their solubility. So you see here, uh, the blue color dye has traveled to a constant distance. And this pink color has traveled to a uh, certain distance. But here, <clears throat> uh, we have not uh, <clears throat> mixed this green color into this X. That's why we didn't get X. But we here, we have mixed this yellow color. So as I, the, what I told is wrong, right? So you have to read carefully. Paper chromatography can also be used to identify substances. For example, mixer X is thought to contain substances A, B, C, and D, which are all soluble in propanone, right? So the, 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 now if you, when we select the solvent, the substances should be dissolved, soluble. So the, the substances should be soluble in those, in those, uh, the substances that we have to uh, use should be soluble in the solvent, okay? Right, now from this, we can identify the uh, RF factor, retention factor, right? Okay, now you just go through these things we have already discussed uh, earlier, I think in grade seven. Okay. Now, if the, if the substance is uh, colorless, we have to use locating agent. We have to spray locating agent. And here in this uh, experiment, right, here we used um, amino acid, right? So amino acids are uh, colorless. So to, to identify the posi positions of the amino acid after uh, the chromatogram is obtained, we have to use ninhydrin, right? Ninhydrin, so that it will uh, give a different color so that you can see where it has gone, right? Now you don't need to remember the RF values. You just want to remember this equation, right? Okay. Now we will move to the next question. Okay. Now we will look at the 38th question. Here you see uh, the flow diagram shows how polyethene may be made from petroleum, right? So polyethene is formed from petroleum. Now from petroleum, fuel oil is extracted from fractional distillation. This should uh, be in your mind, right? So we haven't studied about this uh, petroleum refining and other things. First, I will teach those things to you and we will come to this uh, petroleum refining. Okay, now we will first see what is petroleum, right? So petroleum is a fossil fuel. So you can just read these things. The fossil fuels are petroleum, or we call it, a, we call it as crude oil also, right? Coal and natural gas. They are called fossil fuels because they are the remains of plants and animals that lived millions, years of, millions of years ago. 
Right. Now, fossil fuels are obtained from the remains of dead plants and dead animals that uh, died uh, uh, quite large years ago, right? Okay. Now, fossil fuels are petroleum. Now, from the fossil fuels, we are going to refine petroleum, right? So, you see here, now here, from the crude oil, uh, so crude oil is a form of petroleum. Uh, petroleum formed from the remains of dead organisms that fell to the ocean floor and were buried under thick sediment. High pressure slowly converted them to petroleum over millions of years ago. Now, what is petroleum? Now, petroleum is an organic compound. So, organic compound is the compounds with carbon and hydrogen. There will be direct bond between carbon and hydrogen. Unlike, uh, so the opposite of inorganic compounds is organic compounds, right? So, they will have direct connection between hydrogen and carbon. Okay. Right. In fact, most uh, are hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbons mean they have only hydrogen and carbons, right? So hydrocarbons mean they contain only carbon and hydrogens. Okay, so you should remember these things also, right? Now, uh, petroleum is used in aircraft and factories and in some uh, uh, chemicals, right? So in some chemicals also. Now, what are renewable, non-renewable resources? So you see this point, petroleum is still forming. Why? Because many animals and many plants die each day. And uh, after a few years, they will form uh, what uh, fossil fuels. Now, petroleum is still forming, but uh, very slowly because the process of formation of petroleum is very slow under the ocean. Normally, the petroleum formation process occurs in oceans right but we are using it up much faster than it can form but you see now if you represent it using a graph right so this is the formation of this is the formation of petroleum but we are using like this okay so the rate that we use petroleum is higher than the formation of petroleum right so one day we will run out of petroleum so this petroleum is also called non-renewable resources. We cannot use repeatedly. Once used, that is finished, right? Okay. Now, what I wanted to do is here refining petroleum. Uh -huh. I wanted to discuss about refining petroleum. So refining petroleum means, let's see. Right. Now refining petroleum is done by fractional distillation. So if you look at here, if you look at here, uh, petroleum fuel oil. Okay, now uh, petroleum refining, right? So here you see, now using fractional distillation column, so this is called fractional distillation column, we get foil, fuel oil, right? Fuel oil by fractional distillation. From petroleum, we uh, we get some fractions. So refinery gas, gasoline, that is petrol, naphtha, paraffin, diesel, fuel oil, and lubricating fraction. So this process is done using fractional distillation. So here, if you look at this question, the answer can be C or D, right? And from fuel oil, from fuel oil means that is uh, ethene, right? So from fuel oil, ethene is obtained from cracking. Cracking means breaking. Now this is a large molecule, but ethene is a smaller molecule. By breaking uh, for fuel oil, we can obtain ethene, right? So you can just read here. You see examples of cracking. Cracking means, you see, cracking the refinery. So what is, that is uh, fuel oil. From fuel oil, we are going to crack the uh, refinery, right? So cracking the naphtha fraction. Now naphtha fraction means that is carbon 10. Now this is a huge molecule. Now if you add the pressure and temperature with catalyst, now this is going to be broken into smaller substances. Now by breaking naphtha, we can obtain pentane. Pentane mean this pentane mean the carbon containing the the 
uh, organic compound containing five carbons and here we will get uh, propane and here we will get ethene now how many uh, carbons do we have here one two uh, five 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 plus five ten so uh, we are just breaking them right we are just breaking them now from this fuel oil from this fuel oil we can obtain ethene ethene so that process is done using cracking then from ethene we use polymer polyethene now this ethene is a monomer monomer now if you want to do if you want to form polymers that monomer should contain a double bond so ethene c double bond c c double bond c h h right h h and here this is also h h here this is also h h right now if we have a lot of monomers now let's say two 18 molecules now let's assume three 18 molecules right H, 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 H. Now C double bond C, H, H. H. Okay. Now what will happen? This uh, double bond break will break, and but uh, the carbon should have two bonds. So what will happen? This different carbon. Now this double bond will break, and this double bond will break, and this double bond also will break, and between these monomers another bond will be formed. Right? Another bond will be. Okay, now this is called C C H H. Now, how do we do this? By applying temperature and pressure with the catalyst, right? H H. Now we will study about the polymers later, but I will just want to. I just wanted to explain this, right? So now we will have large molecules now mo polymers are large molecules and right so from the monomers smaller molecules we have joined together they have we, they we have joined monomers together to form a polymer by applying high temperature pressure and catalyst because we have to apply them for breaking this bond okay now the answer should be uh, fractional distillation then cracking now from ethene, polyethene is formed by polymerization. So the answer should be C, right? Okay. Now, there are many questions in organic chemistry. Okay. I think we discussed till seventh question. Now let me explain you from the eighth question, right? So which substance is a mixture? So they are telling air, they are telling air, graphite, oxygen, water. So mixture, they are talking about mixture, not about pure substances, right? So mixture. So the definitely, apparently, directly, the answer is air because air is a mixture of different gases. We have carbon dioxide, we have oxygen, and we have nitrogen in large quantity, and we have argon gas also, right? So we have different types of gases. So air is a mixture of gases. So you can just type this. Air is a mixture of gases right okay so the answer is directly yeah graphite that is carbon that is not a mixture right so that is an allotrope of carbon and oxygen oxygen if it is an element this is o and if it is o2 that is a molecule if it is 
O2 there is a molecule okay and it is a diatomic molecule right so oxygen is a diatomic molecule and water means that is H2O that is not a mixture right so that is also a molecule a pure substance right now we will look at the ninth question we will look at the ninth question right so the number of moles of atoms x y and z in compound are shown so x we have uh, 0 0.6 moles y have uh, we have 1.2 0 0.3 okay what is the formula of this compound so they have given the moles right so what we have to do here is um, atom Uh, now x we have x we have 0 0.6 0 0.6 now we y we have uh, 1.2 1.2 and z we have 0 0.3 0 0.3 now we need the simplest ratio of moles right so here directly we have been given moles right Otherwise, if they give mass, they should have given the uh, atomic mass of these elements or atoms also. So what we have to do is we have to just uh, simplify this to a simplest ratio. So I just multiply this by 10, right? So 6, 12, and 3. Now, again, I have to find the simplest ratio. That is, now if I simplify these three values by 3, I will get 2, 4, and 1. So I have... 2 oxygen, 2 oxygen, 4y, I'm sorry, 2x and 4y's uh, and 1z. So the answer would be x, 2, y, 4 and z. So this is the answer. So what is the answer? So d is the answer. Okay. Now we will move to the uh, 10th question. So, one mole of silver nitrate, AgNO3, contains 1.2 to the power 10 to the power uh, into 10 to the power 24 ions. How many ions are there in 0 0.25 moles of iron 3 oxide, Fe2O3? Okay. One mole of AgNO3. Now, one mole of AgNO3 contains. So, irrespective of the uh, substance, if we have mole, one mole of any substance contains uh, Avogadro number of elements, right? Okay. But here they are telling one mole of silver AgNO3 contains 1.2 power of this ions, right? So, 0 0.25 mole of iron will contain. So, here doesn't matter. So how we have to calculate this is one mole of AgNO3 contains uh, this amount of molecule. So 0 0.25 means uh, one fourth of one mole will be the one fourth of this value, right? So one fourth of this value will be one divided by four times 1.2, 1.2. Into 10 to the power 20, 10 to the power 24. So the answer would be here 0 0.3, right? 0 0.3 that is equal to 0 0.3 into 10 to the power 24, 10 to the power 24. So the answer should be this, right? Um, this cannot be the answer. Yeah, three point. This cannot be the answer. You see, uh, this answer is related to three, and this three answer is related to three. So we have two responses. So definitely, this should be the answer. But here, the answer is zero point three. But uh, here, three point ten to the power twenty four. No, that is zero point. Now this is equal to if I take uh, one ten to 
multiply the 0 0.3 to obtain 3. Now this will be 3 times 10 to the power 23. So the answer is B, right? So the answer is B. So what you should uh, know here is one mole of any substance contain the same number of ions. So here they are telling that contains 1.2 to the power 10 to the power into 10 to the power 24, which means uh, normally we say one mole of any substance contain Avogadro number of ions. But here they are telling 1.2 means uh, this Fe2O3 will contain one fourth of 0 0.25 mole of iron oxide will contain one fourth of this amount of ions. So with that, I'm going to conclude this video. And in our next class, we will be uh, starting from the 11th question. Okay.